Well, without a doubt, I'm sure the year 2020 is one that we just want to get behind us, get in the pages of history, and move on. And hopefully the year 2021 will have a lot of bright spots and hope and a lot of improvement uh, for us as a, as a community, a nation, and a world, but also personally. But we don't have to wait until January 1st for that. Today is literally the new year. This is the, uh, the first day of the new liturgical season where we move into year B in our three-year Sunday cycle. And we begin with the season of Advent in order for us to focus ourselves on the coming of Christ. As we remember his first coming at his birth and nativity 2,000 years ago, but also to prepare ourselves for that second coming or when we have to stand before our Savior at the end of our lives. But this past year, we've been so focused on so many other, other different things. COVID, the economy, the election, and just all of this stuff, the rioting and just the chaos in the streets of America and many of our major cities. And we've taken our sights off of God. And so Advent is precisely what we need at this time to refocus ourselves and our Christian faith and to remind us who we are and whose we are. And so I think a great um, discipline for us, a great practice during this Advent season is for us to read this book that we have for you. It's in the gathering space. It's free. Um, it's called I Heard God Laugh by Matthew Kelly. And unlike the other book, it's not just um, the one where we just read a chapter a day um, for about a month or so, but we try to read this maybe in the four weeks of Lent or excuse me, Advent, and there are some phenomenal things in here that can radically change our prayer life and take us to an unknown or unheard of level of spirituality for us. And so I just want to share a couple of things um, from the beginning of the book where he says, you are not what has happened to you. You are not what you have accomplished. You are not even who you are today or who you have become so far. You are who and what you are still capable of becoming. But many times we have the attitude that we're retired. We might say, I was a school teacher. I was a thoracic surgeon. I myself was an engineer. And we might, even athletes can retire even in their 20s. Gymnasts retire in their late teens or their early 20s, but their life has been defined about the things they've, they've accomplished. And some people, when they're retired, they, do not, they don't know what to do. Some athletes will hang on until their early 40s because they can't imagine life off the field. And our best days are not behind us. Rather, they are yet to be. And so we look at the examples of folks in the Bible. Moses was 80 years old when God chose him to be the one that would lead um, Israel out of the slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea towards the Promised Land. Why didn't he call him earlier? Well, when he was 40 years old, what did Moses do? He murdered a man. And so God waits until we are ready, and sometimes it's going to be at an older age, but our best days are yet to come. And so we are not, uh, we cannot identify ourselves by the diploma that's on our wall or the letters that's after our names, MD, PhD, PE, whatever it might be. The best of us is yet to come. And that's going to be found out through prayer and going to the Father. He's the potter that made us, and as we heard in the first reading, we are the clay. And so he wants us to be the best version of ourselves that we can be, but we must go to him. Now, he, Matthew Kelly goes on to say about how comfort is a danger zone for us. And so things aren't great in our lives, but they're not horrible either. So do we continue to muddle along in that mediocrity? and gravitate towards comfort, or do we try to rise up and live the best life possible? He asks us the honest question, are you thriving or just surviving? Are we truly living or are we merely existing? We neglect the soul in favor of the body, and the body is constantly barking orders at us. Feed me, change me, give me a drink, 
Give me something else to eat. Give me a stiffer drink. And let's go to bed. Let's go for a walk. And so the body is always leading us and telling us what to do, even to do sinful things. But the soul is waiting also for us to feed it and nourish it with prayer. That's when we charge our batteries spiritually. And so for us to be able to live truly fully lives as God intends us to, we must realize that we are spiritual beings first, having a physical experience in this world. And Matthew Kelly goes on to say in his book that, as I've mentioned before, we always hear as Catholics the importance of praying, but really we've never been taught how to pray. Oh, we've been taught powerful prayers. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Words of an angel. They're good enough for an angel, they're good enough for us. Or the Our Father, Jesus' personal prayer to the Father. And that's one of the first prayers that we learn, but we've never been taught a process of how to pray. Any athlete has to, they might have God-given talents and abilities, but they still need to be taught how to do their sport. Some guys arguably are so blessed, they can just show up, put on a uniform, and they will just dominate. But imagine a pole vaulter. If no one taught him how to pole vault, but just gave him a little advice. Take this stick, run as fast as you can, stick it in that little box at the end of the runway and see what happens. You know what's gonna happen? Your momentum is gonna stop immediately, the bar's not gonna bend, and you're gonna go flying and probably break something. But if a coach tells you how to use that pole and how to place it in there and how to get high up in the air, then once they learn how to do that, that athlete will spend countless hours a day, many of it failing, but they will spend countless hours a day trying to get that extra inch. They're not looking to break records by a foot or two, but just a half an inch or an inch each time, and they will keep doing it until they can't do it anymore. And so it's the same thing with prayer, once we find this process that Matthew Kelly gives us in this book, it's just a seven-step process. He said it takes 10 minutes, start, you know, try it in the morning, and then maybe if we can do it at the end of the day, too, to do an inventory of our days. But it starts, the first step, I'll give you a spoiler alert, it starts with gratitude. It starts by us being grateful for the things that are going well in our lives. It is far too easy to focus on the chaos and the messiness of the world, but if we just take a moment and thank God for what is not crashing down around us, what is not on fire, what is stable, and thank God for that. Because after every Good Friday comes a resurrection just a few days later. After every darkness, there is a dawn that brings new light. And so we first start off not by complaining to God, but by thanking God. And then it makes everything easier. Then you can read what the other steps are. And if we just do that for 10 minutes, 10 minutes will melt away and instantly 20 will have passed and we'll be better off for it. He goes on to say that an essential practical virtue of prayer is patience. That's something that we get from prayer is patience. Prayer teaches us how to live and how to love. It teaches us how to be patient. And two patient people will always have a better relationship than two impatient people. And so maybe that can be part of our Advent journey is to take this book and read it and put it into practice because our lives change when our habits change. Are you the most patient person in the world? Is your spouse the most patient person in the world? Then you don't need this book. You're already doing what you're supposed to do. But if you realize you're both impatient and you're married, take four copies of this. One for each of you and two for her in case she loses hers. Please, that's part of what we need to do as Christians but also as Americans. We have to get our eyes not on politicians, not on policies, not on mobs that are going, that are putting fear into people's hearts, but we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what the church has always done, and we have survived horrible times in our world's existence. No time was worse than about 2,000 years ago, 
for the Jews that were in Jerusalem. And at that time, God sent his son, Jesus, into the world. But first, he had to get the permission of the Blessed Mother. And so way back on March 25th, we celebrated the Feast of the Annunciation, where the Archangel Gabriel came to Our Lady and said, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. And she heard two words yoked together that no patriarch or prophet had ever heard. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you and come upon you, and the child that you will bear will be son of the Most High God. And then she paused, meditated upon this. She knew the zealousness of the Pharisees and scribes that would love to stone to death a pregnant, a pregnant unmarried mother. And she said the words, never, not thinking how she's going to explain this to Joseph, but she said the words that altered the destiny of humankind. Ecce ancile domine, fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to thy word. And at that moment, Jesus Christ took flesh and entered into Mary's womb, unseen by the world, unbeknownst to anyone but her. And so at Advent, we basically celebrate the last four weeks of that pregnancy. Oh yes, we know the due date, of Jesus, so it'll be December 25th, but it's a reminder to all of us, even a woman that's pregnant, an uh, average pregnancy is 40 weeks, but you can give birth really at any time before that. And so that little critter, he's ready at 36 weeks, 37, 38, do I hear 39? And so you don't know exactly when that's gonna be, and so that's why we have to be vigilant. And so we can't be presumptuous to know how much time do we have left in the world. Every Advent, we fall into the same trap. We have good intentions, but the busyness and the craziness of Advent takes over. It's not a season of preparation, but it's a shopping season. We talk about Black Friday that keeps getting goosed back further and further. You know, before it was never before, um, you know, Thanksgiving. Now it's kind of even before Halloween, and sometimes it's even in June. They can't wait to get our money, the culture and the society. But this year of COVID is going to be different. There's going to be less Christmas parties. There's not going to be the communal penance services that we normally go to and priests. We're going to have a lot more free time on our hands. So please call the office if you want to come in for a confession. Because we're with COVID and the distancing, we're not able to have penance services in churches really anymore because, you know, I mean, if you've got someone that's, you know, six or seven feet away from you, they're hard of hearing, and then, Father, I did this about 12 times. <laughs> so you're not going to have the privacy and all of a sudden with just the crowding people in, but the priests are going to have more time. So please call and let's wipe the slate clean. Let's give your families a better version of you to place. We're going to be like pole vaulters that are going to be seeking ever higher heights all the time, not just for 10 minutes, but we'll be out there training so that we can not just win a personal medal for ourselves, but for team Jesus. And Advent is a wonderful time for us since we're going to have more time on our hands now to focus perhaps on reading scripture, maybe helping agencies like Birth Choice that help pregnant women, those that are courageous enough to say, I don't need a handout, I just need a hand up. I just need a little bit of help here. And so to try to remember what Mary did, she had nothing to gain, she had everything to lose, but she trusted in the Lord. And so by us doing this prayer process, by trying to pray daily, we can give our families the best gift possible. It's not a tennis bracelet. It's not, you know, a, a new bicycle or a new car or anything like that. But it takes time for us to become the best version of ourselves, to pray and to let God, the potter, shape us into the saint that he wishes us to be. And so as we enter into this season of Advent, perhaps a new habit that we can get into that might make a huge difference in the lives of others around us, is if we can get into the habit of when we go to the grocery store or anytime there's another human being that we're talking to at the bank or at a store or something like that, or even on the phone, if our last words to them can be, may God bless you. 
say, may God bless you. They might need that blessing. You are temples of the Holy Spirit. You are other Christs. You receive that at your baptism. And you don't have your baptism certificate framed on the wall in your office if you're a lawyer or a doctor and even an engineer, but that's the most important piece of paper we have. And so we can share that blessing with others and it becomes what's called efficacious, meaning it has power. And so if we can start to loosen up our tongues a little bit and not curse the darkness, but to light a candle and to say to people our last words to them, may God bless you. Perhaps that the, that's the problem in our world today. People haven't heard that enough only because we as Christians have not said it enough.